What's up, Relic fans? This is Buggo coming to you from the Relic Head offices in Vancouver, British Columbia. And we are here with Mr. Rob Cunningham, and he is currently the Director of Concept and Visualization at Relic. So, what do you do in your new role? Um, in my new role, I do pretty much what I did in my old role, which was um, I, I run a small visualization team. We call it the Viz team, and uh, it's made up of concept artists, and together we work with the art directors and lead designers and sometimes the executives at Relic to visualize concepts and develop concepts for our games. So these can be anything from landscapes to inspirational paintings to unit designs, level designs, storyboards for cinematic sequences, stuff like that. Great. So can you describe a typical day at work at Relic? A typical day? Um, a typical day would probably involve me uh, taking care of some emails in the morning probably and then uh, I'd probably meet with my team and we talk about the work they're doing and what's coming up next and when they expect to be finished and uh, that kind of administrative stuff and then now I'll probably typically I'll have a meeting or two in the afternoon and uh, you know go through some stuff with people and if I'm lucky I'll do some painting. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so what's your career background? How did you get into Relic? Um, well I'm one of the founders of Relic so uh, there, there was no Relic before. Um, I, I was previously doing uh, film illustrations, so storyboards and set visualizations for movies, and uh, kind of got into games sort of by accident. I was um, friends with Alex Garden, and he started Relic and joined uh, up with me and, and four other guys, and, um, mm -hmm. and we started it that way. So it was, it was kind of, I, I never intended to, to join the, the gaming industry, so it's kind of an accident, actually. Hmm. So did you have any mentors growing up in terms of your art style or influences in that sense? Um, kind of. I, I have the standard influences that most people have, you know, like Sid Mead or Craig Mullins or these brilliant painters. But um, to be honest, I think the biggest influence for me was my partner, Aaron Canvitz, who is also one of the founders of Relic, now no longer with Relic, he's independent. But uh, he, he taught me a great deal about using computers especially and, and, and how to... Um, use that tool, really, mm -hmm. you know. So can you give us some insight into how you come up with art and direction for your projects at Relic? Um, it's kind of a gut level thing. It's sort of a, it's a kind of an emotional um, exploration of the content, whatever you're, uh, you know, working on. Um, it, 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 it all depends on, on, on what it is that, um, what, what's the job. Often, just you know, go for a walk with someone or grab a coffee and just you know talk about the the objective and try and clarify what the intent is. And uh, if you can get a good handle on what what the what the intent is, then then you're much better equipped to actually knock off uh, images that start articulating that and getting a little closer, you know, to the mark. And once once you're pretty once everyone's pretty happy about where it's going, then you can start hammering on some you know good looking comps and some nice digital painting. Mm -hmm. So when you're creating these digital paintings or comps, what specific software or tools do you prefer? I, I work these days exclusively in Photoshop with my Cintiq mm -hmm. uh, tablet here. So um, it's either it's either digital painting with the Cintiq in Photoshop or I'm you know with a pencil on a piece of paper. Basically, right. it's, that's pretty much it for me. I don't use any 3D software besides maybe SketchUp. Occasionally, I'll use SketchUp to pre-visualize a 3D um, environment if it's, if it's particularly complicated or the perspective is difficult, but generally generally it's just Photoshop hmm. with my Cintiq. Interesting. So how long does it take you to create a quick concept sketch versus a full model? Um, wow, a, a concept sketch can take anywhere from like a minute to, uh, <laughs> to uh, you know, a couple hours. Generally, right. generally I, I don't really work on anything for longer than a couple of hours. I think a couple of hours is maybe three hours or four hours is the longest I've ever spent on a piece of on a, on a single piece of work. Um, I, I guess I'm lucky that way. I, I, I'm kind of, um, I guess, either lazy or easily distracted. But one, <laughs> one way or another, I, I, I prefer to just move quickly and and get on to the next painting. I'm not really a, a, a fine detail type, finishing type artist. Okay. So can you maybe describe for our viewers what projects you've worked on with Relic in the past and what roles you did on those, in case anyone didn't already know? Uh, sure. The, um, when we started Relic, I was the art director of Homeworld, Homeworld 1. Um, and 
I did a lot of the ship designs, worked on the story, directed the voice talent, um, directed all the cinematic sequences for that, um, and the music as well. Paul Ruske did the music and the audio for, for Homeworld. Um, and then I uh, worked on Homeworld 2 uh, in much the same role, did, do, doing the same things. Um, there was uh, there was some develop concept development work on some projects that didn't go anywhere in between that and uh, the next thing, which was Dawn of War. I, I didn't do too much on Dawn of War, just the intro sequence that was um, made by Blur Studios. And... Uh, <laughs> I directed that and uh, worked with Andy on the look of the game a little bit, but that was mostly his deal. And then um, on COH, uh, worked primarily in the story development and cinematic direction. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah. So which project did you find the most interesting to work on? Um, I think I probably have to say Homeworld because it was the first one and, and it was kind of a, everything was new and, and, and exciting and there was only a few of us and, and at the same time we were making the game, we were also making the company, so right. it had this kind of dual, it was kind of doubly interesting, like the other projects, it was all just about the game, so it was a bit more um, focused and limited, you know, mm -hmm. it's it's more exciting when you're not only creating a game, but also a, an entire company, so. Totally. It's probably, probably Homeworld 1, I'd have to say. Not that the others were <laughs> less interesting, but right. in the context, I, I think I'd have to say Homeworld 1 was probably the most exciting. Hmm. So, I mean, you've worked on Homeworld, Dawn of War, and Company of Heroes, and they're all pretty different in their art style. So how is it to work with such different art styles and different projects? Um... To be honest, I think it's it's um, less for me less an issue of style and uh, more an uh, an issue of um, uh, like treatment or, or delivery um, intent. Like um, Homeworld had this kind of you know very big, colorful, epic sort of uh, quality, and and mm -hmm. you know that had its own sort of challenges and what and whatnot. And the others have sort of different. It, each one is different. Like Company of Heroes, you've got a World War Two setting so you you've got a lot of you're you're in good company i mean a lot of people have done world war ii content before so you've got kind of you've got creative challenges there you don't want to you, you want to you want it to look like something but not too much like it otherwise you're ripping them off and so on you know so right. um <laughs> company heroes my favorite cutscene in that i'd say i'd say is probably the one that there were there were more interesting and more difficult cutscenes, but I think the one that I liked the most was the uh, one at the end of Mission Three, where the MG crew set up an MG emplacement and mow down a, a bunch of Germans trying to retreat, and and all the audio kind of cuts away, and the, and the music sort of carries the scene. And I think the reason I liked it the best was was because um, at the end of the scene there, this the, the the loader next to the MG, he doesn't have any lines, but he kind of looks really disturbed at the. This guy's just murdered all these Germans, and this this one dude, and his his CEO is telling him off. But the other guy is just kind of looking away, like you know, what what's going on here? <laughs> this is kind of this moment where it kind of it seemed to sort of transcend uh, a little bit, and actually felt kind of dramatic and, mm -hmm. and very cool. So I think awesome. I like that one the most. Hmm. So across all relic games, which was your favorite unit? My favorite unit. Yes. Like vehicle or whatever. Yeah, unit or infantry unit or character. Um, that's a tough question. There's been a lot. <laughs> a lot of, to pick from. There's, there's, yeah, yeah, there's been a lot of there've been a lot of neat ones. You know, I think I have to say that my favorite was the um, Kushan Destroyer from Homeworld One. Mm. I, I like that one the most. I think. How would you say your personal style has evolved during your time at Relic? I would say that my personal style has probably gotten messier and quicker. <laughs> it's uh, it's um. I was a lot more careful at the beginning, and, and now I think I'm, I, I move a lot quicker and uh, don't worry so much. Mm -hmm. So it's become a lot looser and a lot more sort of um, gestural, I think. Right. But, but uh, not like abstract or anything. You know? mm -hmm. What, if any, were your inspirations for the Homeworld and Homeworld 2 art, including ship design, backgrounds, cutscene animations? It's quite a big question. <laughs> nope, yeah. Um, 
I think it, it's widely known that for the ship designs, um, me and Aaron were heavily influenced by the work from the 70s, um, guys like Peter Elson, uh, Chris Voss. Um, I was also heavily influenced by comic book artists like Cam Kennedy. Um, and, uh, for the um, for the backgrounds, uh, for the skies and stuff, you know, I, I got to say, I think my hev my biggest influence for creating the the um, the look of the skies in, in Homeworld One was just road tripping across America. I, I was fond of, um, and still am, fond of driving on big road trips. And yeah. I, I drove. Would you like to tell the users what car you drive? Uh, <laughs> well, I, I drive a Lotus now, but at the time I drove a Honda Civic, and uh, okay. and that was that was fine. And um, dri driving across America was. Um, uh, I did that six times, and, and it was um, it just spectacular, the skies that you would see. So it, it occurred to me that I was always driving, especially when you're driving west to Vancouver from the east coast, you're every, every day you're driving into the sunset, and the sun sets in front of you every day, every day, every day. So you're, you're, it's like you're trying to reach the sunset. So that, that concept really appealed to me because it gave you, it, it kind of linked every day to the next, and it gave you this kind of, Consistency, consistency across the journey, like you were forever trying to, to reach the sunset, and that that I felt resonated with the homeworld story of trying to go home to your to your homeworld. So mm -hmm. I think that's where the backgrounds for homeworld came from. They got ever brighter and, and warmer until you were ultimately at the end of homeworld. You were like in the sunset. <laughs> um, and uh, sorry, what was the third part of that question? Um, Cutscene animations. The animations. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, the the uh, the NISs and, and animatics I think were probably most heavily in, influenced by sci-fi movies like Star Wars. Um, they, they had this kind of slow quality with stuff, you know, m moving around, and we wanted to leave as much room as possible for speech and music. So. Mm -hmm. um, I guess maybe 2001 and, and like Aliens, you know, these, these kind of, possibly a bit of Blade Runner, but that was a bit darker, you know, mm -hmm. it, was, it was more, um, it was I love of, Blade Runner. Yeah, same, <laughs> it's, it's probably one of the best sci-fi movies yeah. ever made, I think, uh, yeah. Awesome. Uh, so if you were given the chance to remake the art of Homeworld 1 and 2, would you change anything? Um... You always want to go back and fuss with that thing you didn't like, you know? So, so yeah, probably. I, I'd probably have to sort of, you know, sit, sit down and think about it for a while, but I'm sure there's something about the, both of those projects that I'd, I'd want to change, you know, some shit that didn't work so well or, or, or whatever, but probably not that much. I, I'm pretty happy with the way those games looked, you know? Yeah. They, I thought they, thought they did, did justice to the look of the, the technology and, um, those big spaceships, I think it, it felt about right. If I did change anything, it would be probably pretty minor. I think for Humboldt 2, it would be more of a story that I would have changed than the, than the actual ships themselves, right. you know. So what would you change in the story? Well, I always felt, I, I mean, I liked the story of Humboldt 2. I thought it was, um, you know, grandiose and everything, but I felt that it just was a, perhaps a little bit too noodly, you know, like a little bit too complicated and, huh. And I think that was successful, but I think in our efforts to achieve that depth, we kind of lost sight of the power of simplicity. And I think that's what really drove um, Homeworld 1 home for people. It was that you're just going home. It's so simple. You know, the, 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 the premise of the story was very easy to understand and relate to. Mm -hmm. Whereas with Homeworld 2, it was all about, you know, these three hyperspace cores, and they had to come together and then unlock this kind of god Beast and and you know it was cool, but it was it was pretty complicated stuff and and there were a lot of inconsistencies and it's tough to tell a complex story, you know. Right. So. Well, <laughs> you know? yeah, that's true. <laughs> so, what advice would you give to somebody interested in your field of work? Um, what advice? I would say, is someone interested in doing concept work for games and direction for games, I think needs. Not so much to be um, an expert at games, but rather um, they, they need to understand um, what motivates people. You know, they, I think you got to be able to you got to be in touch with emotionally resonant images. Like um, you know, anyone could can draw a tank, but I think a concept art, a professional concept artist, has to be able to draw a tank that 
gives you that feeling of, whoa, I don't want to see that thing coming at me, you know, like, or, um, there's a, you have to kind of somehow connect with people, um, on an emotional level to, to be, I think, a concept artist in video games. Otherwise, your art's going to be dry and you'd probably be better suited doing something else if, if, if you can't quite get on that, uh, level. The same, same applies for storytelling and, um, you know, other, other aspects of art direction in, in video games. But I think it's really that emotional contact is the, is the important, is the important point. How one develops that, I, I think, is different for, for everyone. Obviously, going to art school helps a lot. You know, you just train and you become a better technician at, at your, um, craft. You know? Did you go to art school at all? I did, yeah. I went to the Rhode Island School of Design. Um, graduated with a BFA in illustration. Wow. Which was huge for me, mm. you know. And, RISD was a great school, but I, I think what was more important than it being a great school is that they just made you make a lot of art. <laughs> like, if you want to do art, you got to do art, like a lot of it, and just keep doing it. And just, do, you know, for every hundred paintings you make, show people four mm-hmm. and toss the rest, you know, like consider them they're just development. You, you know, you're not going to tell everyone the story of how you walked out the house to get to the front yard you, mm-hmm. when the destination is the next town. You're going to, you know what I mean? You just gotta keep doing the stuff. Just keep doing it, keep doing it, keep doing it until you just get better and better and better. And soon you'll find out if you're any good at this or if you're enjoying it. You gotta enjoy it. I think that that's the main thing. If you're having fun, then other people will too. It's generally fun is like contagious, you know? Mm-hmm. So speaking of fun, what do you do in your spare time? Um, I like to drive my car. <laughs> <laughs> so you have a Lotus, yeah. but it's a, wanna expand on that one? Tell us a little about your baby. Um, yeah. Her favorite thing is to, is to munch on cash. It's expensive, <laughs> expensive car. And, um, it's, I've always loved that car. It's, it's an Esprit. It's a Lotus Esprit 2001 V8 3.5 twin turbo. Uh, it's a badass car. That thing, that thing hauls. And it's really fun. You know, school kids love it. They like wave at you from the bus and stuff. And it just happened coming to work this morning, actually. Um, but, um, it, it's, it's, it's really, great to have such a high performance um piece of machinery at your fingertips you just it you appreciate the sensitivity of of it and and how it drives and you just get training it's kind of it's become like a hobby so mm-hmm. yeah that, that's uh what i like doing for fun if i can't do that then i'll probably you know watch a movie or hang out with some friends or something mm-hmm. <laughs> you know great so the question that everyone has been looking for what are you working on right now? Can you give us any hints on that or? Uh, no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm not allowed to, 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 to discuss that. Oh, no. Besides that it's very cool and, uh, it's very <laughs> exciting and, um, it, we're obviously, uh, well, maybe not obviously, but we're at early stages mm-hmm. with it right now. So, um, it, it, it'll be a while, I, I, I assume, before, mm-hmm. before, it becomes sort of, you know, public knowledge, but it's very exciting. And it's very cool. And, um, <laughs> are you doing the art for it? And how I'm are doing, you involved I'm doing concept work yeah. for it and, um, concept development, working with the leads on the project and, uh, and, uh, you know, trying to, trying to get some foundation stuff done and, and, uh, we'll see, we'll see where it goes. It's pretty exciting. Great. So let's do some fun quick fire questions. Just answer them. Don't even think. Mm-hmm. Pirates or ninjas? Pirates. Style or technique? Style. Cake or pie? Pie. Liquor or beer? Beer. <laughs> sci-fi or fantasy? Definitely sci-fi. Kushan or Tidan? Tidan, I think. Okay. Mm-hmm. Dragon or unicorn? Unicorn. Pencil or tablet? That's a close one. That's a real close one. <laughs> I think I'd have to go with pencil. Pencil. Yeah. All right, old school. So let's do some word association, just whatever word comes to mind. So relic. Uh, home. <laughs> home world. Um. Oh, wow. <laughs> uh, home world. Um. Cool. Took a lot of time to come up with cool. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, paint. Um, f- fingers. Forestry sim. Forestry sim? Do you know what uh, that is? No. It's, it's an inside community joke. Apparently, 
they thought that we were doing the simulation with trees and forests as like one of our next projects. Oh yeah, that'd be cool. So, yeah. Like a logger yeah. game. I guess so. That'd be awesome. <laughs> yeah. Well, okay, maybe we'll pass on you that. You have to one. deal with environmentalists, you know. Hmm, that'd be crazy. You know, tree huggers. Yeah. You'd have to take them down. That'd be easy to do in Vancouver. Oh yeah. Yeah. Hmm. You could do like heated interviews with <laughs> loggers and like. Uh huh. I think we're forming some great game concept here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Moving on. Pants. Um, tight. <laughs> <laughs> Old school. Uh, da dusty. Lotus. Nippy. Christmas. Prezies. Great. So now what we're going to do is basically look over Rob's shoulder as he shows us some cool things that he's worked on and maybe even draw us a thing or two. Cool. All right. So, this is where the magic happens. This is where the magic happens. <laughs> um, let's uh, open a new file here. Now, Typically, um, what I do is probably start with just something simple, maybe just like a nice little rectangle. This is art under pressure. Art, <laughs> totally under, this is performance art. <laughs> um, usually if I was doing a ship, for example, for, for a home world, what I'd probably start with is like just to try and get the... Um, the overall shape is I'd probably just um, block in something very, very basic to begin with. Like I know something like this, like and maybe this is um some some kind of large ship. This would be like a probably some kind of mothership class unit. Because you can see that it's got this um, kind of big form to it. Maybe at the same time I'll draw a little strike craft down here and get an idea of some of the characteristic massing that goes into some of these. Yeah, this something, yeah, this is a tie down -y shape like this. So these kind of ships would be related. I'd, I'd imagine these two would kind of be in the same fleet, maybe, even. And you've got, like, some kind of thin action happening on there. Like that. And just, like, lighten those babies up a little bit. And then... Maybe there'd be some kind of, I don't know, some kind of paneling, like... You'd have, like, some kind of... Some kind of panel line arrangement that would maybe something like this. Obviously, this is super rough. Mm -hmm. You'd probably want to get in and do more like detailed, or not detailed, I should say, more careful illustration if you're gonna so you kind of have like a very basic description of the form you might want to kind of like just kind of like darken in some of the engine and component areas. Can you see okay from over there? Yeah, it's looking good. Maybe I should clean this up just a little bit because it's actually pretty messy. But so you kind of start getting kind of is that okay? Yeah, that's good. Um, start kind of getting a little uh, better sense of get a sense of it. And then maybe it needs just a little bit better kind of articulation. Before. 
form on there, you know, like maybe just a little bit of light catching the surfaces. Just a little bit. Stuff like this, perhaps. What I'd probably do next is some kind of like, um, I don't know, let's make these guys tie down ships. <laughs> and what is the decision behind that? What's that? What's the decision be behind that? None really. <laughs> Just feel like doing tie down. I guess in the question you asked me earlier, like tie down or kushan, mm -hmm. and I'm like tie down. So let's make some tie down ships. Oh, that's looking good now. Yeah. Wow. This is. These are the colors of the Tidan fleet. Oops. And the Tidan are known, well, perhaps not known, but the Tidan have this kind of way of coloring their, their ships that are different from the Kushan. They kind of have this, um, these kind of patches, patch, it's kind of like a patchwork type. But there's, um, Generally speaking, there's kind of a, a tension between the. This is kind of getting technical, but there's just kind of like a, like a like a tension between the um, the form of the ship and and the texture of it. Does that make sense? Uh -huh. um, and then let's throw a little bit of orange. Whoops. On some of these things. Actually, I think it was the Kushan fleet that had orange antennas, but never mind. And um, carrying on, what I would do probably to. Uh, I'm speeding this up a lot, obviously, mm -hmm. so what, what would be happening. Um, I'd, I'd be a lot more careful about this if I was actually doing some ships. What I would do is get, go in there and do some high frequency lighting to really say. That it's a big, this is a big capital ship, and you kind of can see where this is kind of going. Maybe there'd be some lights over here, and it looks like the engineering section of the ship. And this guy has probably not got too many lights, but something like that. And then what I'd do is probably take that, copy it, blur it out a little bit. Let's go, give it a little blurage. And we reduce the glow on that guy. Copy that down. Maybe vibe it up. And then I'd probably now I'd want to give those lights some color. So for the tie down, I can't remember what color they had on their light lights. I'm pretty sure it was like red or. I think it was blue, actually. Let's make them blue. Blue looks pretty cool. So you can kind of see, like, what's going on there. And then, I don't know, maybe there's, like, a planet down here or something. <laughs> Enemy units detected. <laughs> so do you always make strange sounds when you're drawing? You know what? I find making sound effects helps the drawing process <laughs> a great deal. I actually, um, I sometimes I think that a good painting is um, can be defined by at least a good concept painting can, and, and this is by no means like you know, gospel or anything. It's just an idea. Um, a good, good, um, good concept painting is um, is is often got lots of sound cues in it. So you know, if you if you can look at a picture and it's full of sound cues, this one doesn't really have too many in it. But um, sometimes it's just a better picture because of the sound cues. You know, you can look at it. I find when little kids do drawings, if you ever watch a little kid do a drawing, the, what's interesting about children when they draw is. Um, 
when they're drawing, it's actually happening. So you'll see kids, they draw like, you know, a guy and he's like running and, and then like, you know, someone shoots him ah, and he dies and then somebody else comes and then a plane shows up and like, and like blows up and it's kind of like, the finished picture is almost irrelevant to the kid. What ha what's important is that they had a war happened, mm -hmm. you know, while they were while they were doing the picture. So, um, I guess it's not totally related matter, but it's it's similar because it's all about sound cues. Let's get those clouds. Let's get that space looking a bit darker. You know, that's you know, and then it just gets more detailed, basically. But that's kind of the gist of it. That's awesome. Cool. cool. Well, thank you very much, Rob, for joining us, and thanks for all the fans for uh, stopping by and downloading the video interview. So we're going to post up this uh, artwork online, if that's okay with Rob. And this picture here. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Okay, and we'll post yeah. it for the forum goes to see. Cool. So thank you very much. All right. Thank you.